All right, complex ion equilibrium is just kind of cool. Complex ions are really fascinating chemical compounds that are kind of a weird blend of a lot of things that we've built on talking about in the general chemistry series. So complex ions themselves are metal ions. We're talking about cations um, that have Lewis base or bases that are coordinate covalently bonded. And um, if you'll recall from our discussions of bonding, coordinate covalent bonds mean that the whole lone pair is coming from one of the elements there. So the lone pair that is being shared comes from one element or one um, side of the chemical bond. Now this is as opposed to other covalent bonds. Covalent bonds, we usually think about one electron coming from one thing, one electron coming from another. They're shared in the middle, right? That's sort of the visual that we have for covalent bonds. When we have a coordinate covalent bond, um, the lone pair comes from one of the elements on that side. It's still shared, hence the covalent part, um, but it just is kind of a weird one. It's a little more rare. Now the Lewis base here is the one that has that lone pair to share or that lone pair to donate, if we want to think about it that way. And recall that a Lewis base coming from Gilbert Lewis, who if you've ever taken classes from me in the past or seen videos about the Lewis dot structure, you know I have a very soft spot in my heart for Gilbert Lewis. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize 41 times and never got a Nobel Prize. So Lewis of Lewis dot fame. Um, also had a system for categorizing acids and bases, and he looked at it with respect to electron or lone pairs, and so he uh, defined bases as lone pair donors and acids as lone pair acceptors. So in this context, when we're talking about complex ions, Lewis bases are called ligands or ligands. I've heard it both pronunciation. I like the shorter I better personally, ligands. So if we're thinking about this, like let's take copper 2 plus, for example. If I have copper 2 plus kind of in solution and I add a few of my chloride ions, I'm going to show my kind of Lewis dot structures here. So I'll put this guy in brackets. So we've lost a couple valence electrons, which means we have a 2 plus charge on our copper. And then our uh, chlorides have an extra electron. So if we have four of them, then these ions in solution are going to coordinately covalently bond. We have this lone pair here that can stick on copper. And the way that these things like to interact with each other is that four of these guys like to stick on my copper. So I end up with kind of copper that looks like this. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. And again, the chlorides here are acting like ligands. The actual name of the ligand is chlorido, which I think is kind of festive. And this whole thing has a net 2 minus charge. Now, uh, without having some experience looking at complex ions or without having some experience about knowing anything about the transition metals, which are all a little bit funny, they're all in that D block of the periodic table, all those weird shifty D electrons that cause them to have sort of weird charges, variable charges, then you may not be able to predict what's going to happen. But once you know the chemical formula for one, and the chemical formula for this guy would look something like this, which again is kind of weird. These are weird compounds. Then you can kind of start to piece together how that works. So this is your Lewis base. This is your ligand your chlorido ligand. And so it's going to be common to have a ligand or a Lewis base um, with something that has lone pairs that are free to be shared because the lone pair here is going to be shared um, with your chloride or sorry your chloride is going to be sharing the lone pairs with your copper here. So we have all these shared pairs. These are your coordinate covalent bonds. So in this case the copper 2 plus is actually acting as a Lewis acid. It's a lone pair acceptor. And your ligand is your lone pair donor. 
So when we're thinking about what would make good Lewis bases or what would make good ligands, then we have to have something with, uh, with lone pairs available. So here's some common ligands that you'll see with some of these complex ions. So if we think about their Lewis dot structures, kind of sketch them out real fast, then we have a lone pair, that just looks like the line, sorry. We have a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen here. So that would be a place where we could do a coordinate covalent bond. If we have um, our hydroxide, looks like this. So we can see that we'd have some lone pairs here on the oxygen that we could use to coordinately covalently bond for our water. If we do the Lewis dot structure, we have a couple lone pairs here that we could share. Cyanide, we know looks like this with a lone pair on each side. So we could kind of share on either side here and then chloride or actually any of the halogens in their ionic form, when they pick up that extra valence electron, that gives them some lone pairs to play around with. So we can see that anything that has these kind of free lone pairs is gonna make a good ligand. And so we can think about kind of how they get put together and then structurally what they look like. So let's go back to that example that I had before. If we do this copper chloride complex ion with a two minus charge, the way that I drew the Lewis dot structure was that two-dimensional version, but if we were thinking about this in three dimensions, which we do since we live in a three-dimensional world after all, then really I have my copper two plus kind of at the center of this thing. There's going to be an attraction with a chloride here, an attraction with a chloride here. One of these guys is coming out at you in 3D. This one's kind of going back in. And this whole thing then, if we're thinking about the three-dimensional or Vesper structure for this, is actually going to have tetrahedral coordination. So this copper ion, this copper two ion, is going to be tetrahedrally coordinated with those four ligands. So depending on how many are surrounding that, you can get a sense of the coordination number, right? The coordination number for this particular transition metal is going to be four which gives it that tetrahedral geometry, which of course has those 109.5 degree angles that we've seen in molecular geometries before. Now, if we think about the chemistry of this, so we're looking at um, the actual equilibrium itself, then we have a process that looks like this. So here's another uh, complex ion. So this is um, silver with ammonium. So ammonia here, if I have two of them, then they can coordinate with my silver plus one. The net charge on this whole thing is a plus one because I'm bringing in a couple neutral ammonia. So we end up with a net plus one or a one fewer electrons on the whole structure sort of operation. Now because the component pieces of my complex ion and the complex ion itself are in equilibrium, then we can talk about the equilibrium constant for this. And that's going to be equal to, as we've seen before, the concentration of the product over the concentrations of my reactants raised to their respective exponents as powers. Now, when we're looking at it this way, where we have the ions that are reacting together to form the complex ion as the forward reaction, right? So our forward reaction in the way that it is written, then this is a Kf value. And uh, this is called the formation constant. Beyonce would love it. Okay, so we have the formation constant. Um, it's also sometimes called the stability constant. And the reason for that, whoops, that's what I get for talking. Um, the reason for that is because it's talking about, it's a measure of how stable this ion is. So for this particular reaction, for the silver with the ammonia, the Kf value is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the seventh. So that's a gigantic number, right? That's a huge number. So we have 17, you know, million. <laughs> this is a gigantic number. That means that if I have these ions in solution, 
this thing is going to form. I would say that we'll probably have the ammonia in excess and we just react as much silver as in solution with that ammonia. This thing would just form. That's the drive to form this thing, and that's what we get. It likes to be this complex ion. Now, if we're thinking about it in the opposite direction, kind of the reverse reaction, so we're thinking about a complex ion into its component pieces, then that would be the inverse of this um, equilibrium constant expression and the inverse of this is going to be called the KD value and the D is for dissociation and the KD value is just going to be the reciprocal right if I was thinking about the reverse reaction and if I was focusing on this guy breaking down in solution as the forward reaction, then this would be the inverse, right? I'd have the reactants on the top, the product on the bottom. So we'd have kind of one over the Kf value. And if I took the inverse or the reciprocal of this value here, right, this big guy, then I'd have a very small number. So the amount that this compound wants to dissociate once it forms is quite low, right? So once I have this guy in solution, once this thing forms, it doesn't want to go back as ions. And that's kind of the information that we get from these Kf and the Kd values. And we'll look at some problems in future videos on how we can utilize this information to find the concentration of ions that will be left over in solution.